Welcome. If we could please call this meeting to order and start with a moment of silence for prayer or reflection. Thank you. Um, just before we get started, I'm going to move up here. This is the, am I alive? Can you hear me? Yep. yep. This is the last council meeting of our city solicitor, Bob Schmidt, after 27 years exactly today. Um, he is retiring with the city of Medicine Hat. He has been um, very respectful and asked that we not make a big deal about this, so I will try to respect his wishes. Um, he made an interesting point tonight that he was first started with the city of Medicine Hat when Premier Ralph Klein was first elected as Premier, so that ages him. And uh, you can think about how long ago that was. But uh, myself, I have now been with you, Bob, almost 13 years, Councillor Friesen and Councillor Dumanowski even longer, and the rest of you I know have come to respect uh, his great legal mind, his uh, sage advice, and his stoic British upper lip uh, for the most part. <laughs> I often refer to uh, the legal department. I try to have my foot on the gas around here, and Bob had his foot on the brake, but he was my sober second thought, and I appreciate every bit of advice he's ever given me. So on behalf of City Council, we have a, just a small token. You might recognize this. Um, be familiar to you? Yeah. <laughs> You may, you may want to put this away somewhere after 27 years if, if you don't want to remember. But thank you very much. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> and uh, Councillor Friesen, if you wanted a point of privilege. Okay, thank you, Your Worship, uh, members of Council. The, um, because it's COVID and we cannot have our groups represent themselves in the gallery like they usually do, the, um, the Elder Abuse Advisory Committee has uh, asked if I would, uh, one, distribute the pins you're wearing tonight uh, and in um, celebration, I guess, or maybe observance of World Elder Abuse Awareness Day marked each year on June 15th, which happens to be today. And uh, they, they gave me a little bit of a statement, which, you know, I wish they were what? here to say it, but you get me instead. So. Um, this is an official United Nations International Day acknowledging the significance of elder abuse as a public health and human rights issue. This year marks the 15th anniversary, and in honour of the day we wear uh, purple, which is what the pin is. Uh, the teepee is also currently lit up in purple lights to celebrate. So if you notice different lighting colour on the teepee, it is in celebration of World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Elder abuse is considered any action or inaction, by a person in a trusting relationship that causes harm or distress to an older adult. The prevalence rate of elder abuse is 8.9% uh, in Alberta, and if you apply that number to Medicine Hat, there are approximately 1,780 older adults experience, experiencing elder abuse and its devastating effects. This year, the provincial theme of the day is Grow the Conversation which is exactly what the committee aimed to do here tonight. The more we speak about elder abuse, the more we learn about it, the more we take action against it, the more protected older adults in Medicine Hat will be. Elder abuse thrives in isolation. In this time of physical distancing, it is our responsibility to check in with, with one another and not allow elder abuse to go unchecked. So thank you to the committee that works on this. They're a very, very passionate group of people and uh, I really admire the work they do and um, they appreciate being allowed to have their statement read tonight. Thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder to those who have phoned in, if you could please uh, mute your mics on your phones um, and uh, we will, uh, if you need to get into the queue to speak, we will try to accommodate you as best we can. Okay. Okay then. Let's start with adoption of the agenda. Any additions? Seeing none. Moving on to adoption of the minutes. Minutes from our last meeting on June the 1st. Errors, missions. 
Seeing none. Next, we have presentations. Our presentation tonight is our um, usual COVID-19 update from Merrick Brown, who's our director of HSC and emergency management. Your Worship, <coughs> members of council, thank you very much for allowing me to provide another update on the city's response strategies for COVID-19. A uh, number of interesting things have occurred here over the past couple of weeks, some, uh, some very exciting, some very challenging, but uh, I think just as we see the progression of um, the, uh, the response strategies and the progression of some of what, what is occurring uh, throughout the province here, we're almost seeing uh, what I'm calling it a, a signal of, of movement to normalcy. So over the past two weeks, we saw um, some interesting things, as I had stated. So stage two relaunch had occurred that um, was modified a little bit, which I'll speak about um, in future slides here. And um, based on that, we do continue to open up our city facilities and modify our approaches based on that. Um, so as it, as it relates to you know signaling uh, normalcy of uh, the province and other municipalities. The province has moved from what's called a, a stage four emergency management activation to what's called a stage, or a stage two emergency management activation. So we, the province moved to uh, full coordination of Government of Alberta um, ministries and agencies down to what's called an augmented response just for a matter of uh, coordination of communication, communication uh, processes. And so also based on some of the signals of, of normalcy of, of within the province, so based on the municipalities across the province, we, the municipalities uh, started at 33 states of local emergency and went down all the way to 17. So less than, uh, or sorry, roughly about half of the municipalities uh, dropped their states of local emergency within a matter of a week. So I just want to remind you, so the city of Medicine Hat did not feel the need to declare the state of local emergency. So we, uh, we were successful throughout this process without those uh, extraordinary powers. So some notable past activities within the uh, city. So based on trends that we've seen throughout the Medicine Hat Police Service is uh, these uh, COVID related incidents or infractions as we call them um, within the public. These incidents are declining and continue to dec decline. I wanna just remind based on the last presentation that I had made is we were sitting roughly in the double digits with infractions when this first started. So I just as we, uh, um, address the slide right here. So May 25th to May 31st. So within that one week period, we only had two infractions. So I commend the public for their, uh, for their uh, service throughout this entire process. So uh, just today, actually, we opened up the, uh, the Esplanade and uh, we reintroduced some transit service. So with, uh, within the Esplanade, within this building that we're in right now, so the public is actually available um, um, it's available for access to the public with some physical distancing requirements with it um, in place. Uh, similar to transit, we have reintroduced uh, what we're calling uh, front door entry. And so with some additional matters, so if the members of the public do use transit as of today, they'll actually see some plexiglass shields that actually protect our, our drivers from, um, from any type of the illness. And we've also introduced uh, re or reintroduced the fare, but at a, at a decreased rate of, um, of approximately a dollar on there. Uh, so we've also eased some restrictions for um, event permits. And this is something that will continue to evolve as we go along. So as the province moves along with uh, easement of uh, the mass gathering restrictions or, or requirements, is we'll adjust our um, event permit restrictions based on that. So this is strictly an event permit. When it comes down to parks permits and facility rentals, those will be coming out here in the near future um, and we'll, we're currently taking them on a case by case basis but given the fact that the province has released or um, eased some of these restrictions we are in lockstep with this as well um, and just on this uh, matter as well as we completed all of our preemptive um, flood measures such as our sandbags and our temporary measures I kind of want to lead wanted to leave this one right to the very end is the spray park so this was a very exciting event uh, for um, I guess the, our residents to be able to experience a, a, hot, a hot weekend with a spray park. And so I commend our parks and recreation staff for being able to actually open up these, um, these spray parks in such a short period of time. So I'll speak about this in a future slide, but we weren't expecting some of these um, items or some of these services to be allowed to open up in such a, a short period of time. So parks or uh, spray parks, pools, 
um, arenas, recreational facilities, we were expecting these to open up later on within stage three. So what the province did is they actually moved some of these items from stage three into stage two. I've mentioned this numerous times, both in my press conferences and um, throughout this um, uh, avenue is, is we get the information the same time as the public does. And so we had to, um, our Parks and Recreation Department, we were able to actually open up two of the four spray parks in a matter of days um, of receiving notification that they were permitted to open them up. So spray parks were lumped in as um, designated as a, as a pool. And so uh, I can I commend uh, our staff for being able to uh, do these in such a short period of time. So what we're gonna do in the future. So we, uh, we based on what happened uh, last week with being able to open up some of, these, uh, so some of these stage three measures in stage two, is we're heavily focusing our efforts on these, um, these facilities, such as pools and parks and, and other recreational facilities. We, we hear the community and we want to be able to work on this process. Um, but at the same time, it's not easy to open these up. So it was much easier to actually shut these things down than it is to open them up. So we depend on what are called sector specific guidelines when we do open them up. And so on uh, Tuesday afternoon when they did announce uh, the stage two with some of those obviously stage three items in there, um, we needed those sector specific guidelines. So the province basically lists what the requirements are for opening up a pool, opening up an arena, opening up an, an, another recreational facility such as the, uh, the fitness equipment in the uh, family leisure center. We need that information to then identify what we need to do. So this comes down to identifying our, our hazards and controls and actually developing formal reopening plans. Um, this is a requirement from Alberta Health Services when it comes down to um, opening up, up uh, facilities that mat were mandated to be shut down. And also we have to recall staff to actually implement some of these controls and then simply making the facility functional. So it's kind of more or less a two-step process um, when it comes to opening, first we have to make the facility safe for our own staff, then we have to make the facility safe, safe for the public. So it's not a matter of days in which we can open up some of these items. We're uh, confident with the, obviously the spray parks given the fact of it's far less complex than say the Family Leisure Centre. So we are heavily focusing our efforts on those items. Um, all, and we're opening up uh, City Hall for public access. So we haven't yet defined a specific date for this, but we're just in the process of finalizing that reopening plan, which I spoke about um, with, uh, in the previous bullet point there, for City Hall. So once, uh, once we can get that um, moving ahead, we'll get, go ahead and um, implement some of these controls and announce a date for that. So as I mentioned, we had some, uh, some challenges, and, but we continue to navigate this, this process uh, successfully. So the provincial relaunch dates are changing, and it's very fluid environment. So, it's, so the uh, provincial government had announced an original date for stage one re re relaunch. They kept that date. However, within stage two, they moved that date forward, meaning it was, it was sooner time when we were originally anticipating it. And then they added some of the uh, stage three items into stage two. So we weren't necessarily expecting some of these. However, we're, we're fluid within this process and, and we've learned as an organization and within um, emergency management to be uh, flexible within this process. Um, and as I'd mentioned right here, we had a fairly short notice of that provincial relaunch. So it's, it was announced on Tuesday to open on a Friday. So a matter of three days in order to open up some of these facilities. So some additional information. So it's important for, for us all to recognize how the, how the province actually moves through uh, these processes and moves through the stages. So we're having, seeing a progression from stage one, stage two, and stage three. And the province is actually relying on uh, case data to know if they're being effective or not or ineffective. And so they're reliant on case counts and um, hospital bed counts to determine if they should move further within stage three or move that data up or potentially um, e um, um, stop easing some of these restrictions. So what's, uh, what's beneficial for all of the public and for to be able to support the province within this process is uh, Alberta Health Services is now allowing anybody to be tested. So not just symptomatic individuals, not, not just um, 
members of the community that may may have come into contact or close contact with um, somebody who was um, positive for COVID-19, but anybody. So I wanted to provide this slide up on here to basically um, direct um, anybody who's watching this to, to go to the Alberta Health Services website, and I have that URL down there, um, and, and actually book a test and because the province is relying on all of us to, to actually get as many tests in as possible so that the province can determine if this process is actually effective. So the more tests that they can do, the more data that they can actually collect to determine if they can move into stage three. So it's more or less a pillar within this entire process. So just in conclusion, we do uh, continue to successfully navigate through this process. Um, we have uh, uh, placed the majority of our efforts on uh, parks, recreation, community facilities, and the like. However, I just want to finish it off that we, this, the virus is still with us. I want to quote Dr. Hinshaw with that one. She has mentioned that numerous times. The virus is still with us and will continue to be with us. So we have to continue to practice some of those basic requirements, such as the physical distancing and personal hygiene. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Merrick. Any questions? Councillor Samra? <clears throat> Hi, Mr. Brown, just so I'm clear, are you, you're encouraging Hatters to go get tested uh, if, if possible? Anybody, uh, anybody sign up and, and get tested as much as possible? Absolutely, I, uh, mm -hmm. I encourage it and anybody can go do it. Obviously the priority is still going to be given to individuals who are symptomatic or for uh, contact tracing purposes, but anybody can go get tested now. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Varga? <coughs> just a question, Merrick. Uh, Restaurants have opened up now too with uh, rules and regulations and who controls that? Uh, excellent question. Uh, so as it relates to Alberta or the restaurants and who controls that, that is Alberta Health Services that is controlling that process. So the municipality doesn't control that process. So uh, we open facilities as per Alberta Health Services guidelines, no different how a restaurant opens up as per Alberta Health Services guidelines. So do they get a certificate or something saying that it's safe to go into their restaurant because they're practicing safe practices or is it on the door or... How, how does it look? I guess I'm just curious as to how a person knows that they're doing the mm -hmm. right thing and, and that they control what's happening and, and don't go over the limits. Uh, that's an excellent question. So within, within um, the Alberta Health Services guidelines um, or those sector specific guidelines, and I had mentioned it in the slide here, is you're required to actually have written reopening plans for anything that was mandated to be closed. So originally in stage one, um, you were required to actually submit your plans to Alberta Health Services um, within seven days of reopening. They have since relaxed that requirement and simply mandated that the employer or the business has a written reopening plan in the event that Alberta Health Services or another health official needs to actually view that reopening plan, but they do not receive any type of certificate. So we're just relying on the business community and the public for that matter to actually follow those uh, requirements set forth. Great, thank you for that. And uh, another question is on our transit system. Um, now that we're allowing them into the, the, the front of the buses, how do we look when they leave the buses? Do we have stops where the driver has to get out and clean a certain spot or how, how, how's that working on the bus when people are, are traveling on the bus and maybe touch the handrails or move around or how, how actually do we look after that with, uh, with the virus still active out there? So we've, uh, we introduced as of today the, the front loading. We still have the, the rear unloading. And so anybody that exits the bus has to um, exit from the rear of the bus. And uh, we do have regular um, uh, sanitation schedules uh, throughout the day on those buses. However, that being said, is there's still that reliance and uh, on the public to you know carry your your little handheld uh, you know sanit or uh, just, um, hand, uh, hand sanitizer with you and things like that. So, thank you for that. I mean, I'm curious all the time as to going to the right spots and making sure that we're all staying safe, right? And in this crazy time and, and the new normal, and some of it won't go away, right? So we're, we're uh, reluctant to go to some of these places when we don't know whether it's safe or not. So thank you for that. Thank you, Councillor Dominowski. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Merrick, thank you for the update. I, it, my first question is somewhat in, in line with Councillor Varga, and, and again, not to um, um, 
presuppose that your department or the city is in charge of everything. There's a lot of conflict of beliefs out there around who has the authority to do what, where, and, and I think those are good questions. But there is some um, confusion, which is probably natural with relaunching uh, strategies, and, and yet there's this uh, rigor around social distancing and, and hand sanitizing and, and keeping uh, spaces and places uh, sterile and clean which um, to some extent come in conflict with one another because as soon as that relaunch started, we have, we've seen and observed people acting differently. And again, we can't control everything and I, and I like the approach that you've taken and, and your department is, let's educate, let's inform, and then let's just uh, hope and plan that as we go forward, they're going to continue to comply. And I think that's the best strategy to go forward with. But so transit, uh, I had down here as well, so we are, I noticed for a long time it said essential travel or essential use only. So, so I'm assuming that has been dropped, that piece of it. So there's front access. Are there, is it still, um, is there scattered seating within a bus itself or, or is it more open and you have to just function within that space? So I'm, I'm seeing you nod. Yeah, so it's, it is still scattered seating um, and we're still relying on that, that essential travel, no different than it is for any other um, type of business on that one or um, um, service, but it is still uh, uh, scattered seating, seating based on the fact that it's still our, um, our transit system and uh, um, just that reliance on keeping the, the public safe on that one as well. And just going back, it's, it's um, maybe silly that I'm asking this question at this stage of how many weeks you've been doing it, but the local state of emergency that you indicated many communities went into, obviously in the past, um, mostly with flooding and uh, we had, you know, the wind storms and other um, times where we've had to go into a, a local state of emergency. One of the main reasons for going into that uh, local state of emergency was that declaration gave us the opportunity to access, do things that we couldn't do otherwise do without that declaration, but it also gave us the opportunity to um, be compensated for costs associated with that emergency uh, with the province and, and I would assume maybe the feds as well, but certainly the province. So have we, by virtue of not doing that, have we incurred any costs directly or indirectly that we, we in other words, have we had lost an opportunity not to suggest that it's, you should just um, flippantly um, declare and, and just hope things will work their way out under that declaration, but have we lost the opportunity or did we lose the opportunity to um, perhaps get compensation for costs associated with, with the ongoing pandemic and, and your, certainly your department and some of the personnel, maybe some added security for facilities were no longer being used in, a, in, a, in the same way. I would imagine there were certain uh, costs that are very different than a flood, for example, that we would have incurred um, that we uh, potentially can't now go back for compensation on, if that makes sense. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, good question on that one. So we would, um, we've declared a state of local emergency in the past, typically as a result to um, flooding or windstorms. And we declare a state of local emergency um, to obtain those extraordinary powers um, as local government, no different than why the province would declare a, uh, um, an emergency, not, not a local emergency, just a, uh, an emergency. Um, now, it's a, it's a bit of a misconception regarding um, the ability for disaster recovery funding only when you declare a state of local emergency. So you can still apply for disaster recovery funding without a state of local emergency. That's not required. So the province hasn't released any um, information on that. However, we have been diligently caught, caught, uh, tracking our costs for that because we have, in fact, uh, incurred additional costs for this. Um, however, the, the province and both the or both the provincial government and the federal government has um, started releasing some some additional grants or, or compensation for that. One was for personal protective equipment, so we've basically taken advantage of some of this thing. So they have been drip feeding <coughs> a couple of um, items to be able to uh, uh, be able to recuperate some of those costs. Thank you for that uh, clarification. And just lastly, I. I um I think to dovetail on what you've already said, I'm certainly we, we're trying to get out there to the public uh, around these uh, notifications we get from the province. We're getting simultaneous um, as a layperson in, in, in the community. And so certainly it takes a lot of time to um, look at the human resource and, and reopening strategies. And, and I'm, 
like you've said, asking the public for their patience because we do get a lot of questions. I know as elected officials, uh, that the moment I heard that, I was like, well, "Is your pool? Are your pools going to be open Friday? And is FLC going to be ready to go? And can we start our organized sports in a full um, capacity again?" And 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 uh, the more we can take the opportunity to to let the public know that that's not um, immediately the case, but we are. You guys are looking at strategies to get these facilities uh, functioning, but there could be some delays certainly uh, with uh, some of these um, developments as we move forward because it's not just as easy as calling people back and opening the doors. So thank you for that continued uh, education that you're giving the public. Any other questions? Seeing none, could I get a motion for reception? Sure, move. Councilor Varga? Second. Councilor Vinovsky, all in favor? Uh, that was unanimous. Councilor Harris, did you vote? Sorry, I didn't. Yeah, thank you. I have to vote. Moving along now to uh, reports. <coughs> Item 5.1 is the Administrative Committee meeting of June the 3rd. This report is for information on the uh, tender awards. So moved. Second. Your Worship. Oh, um, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, can I speak to item two and three? Um, I think, as always, it's very important uh, when City Council approves um, um, funding for projects. So. Um, item two is the Buyer Park uh, lift station and Desert Bloom meter replacement for $1.773 million. And the second one is the Second Avenue Northeast and South Hill area water and sewer rehab. So I wonder <clears throat> through the chair to our CEO if I could ask um, uh, our commissioner, uh, Brad um, Maines, uh, Commissioner of Energy and Utilities, um, to just give uh, our, our citizens uh, an overview of these two, two very valuable projects. Commissioner Maines, if you're available. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, uh, to Councilor Turnbull, uh, regarding that, you know, thank you for the opportunity to elaborate on uh, these two uh, proposals. Uh, the first one is pertains to Briar Park uh, list station. Uh, this is a uh, uh, a rejuvenation of uh, the site that has serviced us for quite some time. The, uh, this tender is designed to upgrade uh, the lift station and to extend its usable life. Uh, the uh, current estimate in this tender proposal was 10 to 15 years. This will dovetail nicely into the ultimate completion of our Briar Park uh, bypass. Uh, at that time frame, uh, we hope to uh, retire uh, this particular lift station, but this will uh, through this uh, capital investment, uh, give us uh, the time needed to continue to provide list services in advance of that uh, that bypass, uh, ultimate bypass completion. Uh, the scope and nature of the work uh, in this particular case allowed us to layer the tender in with also a desert bloom uh, meter replacement. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to upgrade the meter, bring it up to current regulatory standards as it pertains to service into the desert bloom area. Again, a reminder uh, to our residents, ratepayers, and, and also to Council, uh, we uh, sell water and sewer services to the uh, Desert Bloom subdivision, and as a result, uh, uh, we have uh, obligations to ensure that the equipment is of uh, proper standards, and that is what is proposed uh, this evening. The uh, second uh, RFP is for uh, replacements of water and sewer uh, up in the, uh, on 2nd Avenue Northeast in the South Hill area. Uh, this continues to be uh, regular infrastructure uh, expenditures. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're looking at infrastructure that's estimated to be in the 80 to 90 year um, uh, asset life. Uh, so very much uh, uh, over, uh, I would expect, over what was originally intended uh, for its usable life. So uh, this is, again, uh, as we work through uh, our older infrastructure throughout the city, an opportunity to upgrade, bring to modern standards. And in this particular case, uh, particularly around the northeast area, allow for some uh, cosmetic uh, um, aspects in terms of uh, water uh, quality and color. Again, the water is safe, but this will enhance uh, some of the aesthetics of, of the water in that particular area. Hopefully that's uh, sufficient information for you, Councillor. Yes, thank you so very much. And um, uh, I, one of the things I've learned in the three years on Council is that it's very educational when you hear the facts behind the things that we do. Um, cities like Montreal, where they have water leakage of 40%. Why? Because they have aged infrastructure that's so bad, they were actually dumping raw sewage into the St. Lawrence River. 
So lots of cities have allowed their infrastructure to become um, not useful and um, we, uh, when you start to talk about pipes that are 90 and 100 years old that we have in our city, um, our asset management program to replace them is very, very important. So I know it sounds a lot when we talk about $2 million that we are spending here, but the money is well spent. We have good background, as you've heard. So thank you very much for that, and thank you for taking the time to um, uh, educate us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Councillor Friesen. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. I, I just have a, a comment, really. It's, it's on the first item uh, about the overlay, the concrete uh, overlay, <laughs> construction and rehabilitation. I, I certainly by far the smallest of the three items, and, and uh, Councillor Turnbull didn't uh, talk about it, but I just wanted to point out uh, that for me this was significant. Not only is it replacing concrete where it, where it sags and, and has uh, problems or heaves, sinks, whatever it does, but if you look into the uh, description, it talks about uh, rehabilitation of over 20 new wheelchair ramps, which will be installed as part of the program. So while the concrete work is being done, we're also making sure that we're being inclusive and accommodating for all of the folks in our community, and I think that's really significant. So thank you for that. Any other comments? Oh, uh, and I didn't mention that one because I knew that you, as Chairman of Public Services, uh, had the right to ask that question, so. Smooth. <laughs> uh, comments, questions? Right, if we could vote, all in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Our next report is item 5.2, the Development and Infrastructure Committee meeting minutes of June the 3rd. And this is for the uh, adoption um, item, the Vehicle for Hire Bylaw 4617. I'll move that for adoption. I'll second that. Comments? Councillor Friesen? Uh, may I ask a question? Um, I probably to, oh, well, the CAO, let's try, let's try that, and, and you can uh, uh, get some, some other comments from Commissioner Schwarzenberger if we need to have them. I, I don't, uh, I understand the intent of this item, and I don't have a problem with it. I think we have to become more current. We have to, it, hopefully we, it might allow some new business development, perhaps jobs, and um, also customer choice. So I get all that. Uh, it doesn't bother me that way. What concerns me and that I want some reassurance about is how are we making sure that any provider who comes in can assure safety to the riders? I'm really concerned about this. I, I know there are some great alternatives and people use them all the time. Um, but there are also safety concerns. I mean, I just read a, a few days ago about someone who disappeared. Um, I guess I won't name the company, to, but, but uh, who disappeared and hasn't been seen for three days after getting uh, in a, in a, with a ride with one of these companies. So I'm sure that wouldn't happen here or whatever, but I don't know that. And I, I want to know before I support something like this that we have done everything we can to minimize people's risk and maximize their safety. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Friesen. I believe we have Commissioner Schwarzenberger and uh, GM Snyder uh, on the phone, and you'll get a much more thorough response from them. So can I turn it over first to you, Stan? Yes, thank you. Uh, the approach that uh, we've taken uh, with this uh, new bylaw is that uh, we wouldn't... Uh, we wouldn't deviate from the provincial standards that have been established across the province. So uh, they, they've got the built-in um, precautions and, and measures to ensure that there's uh, customer rider uh, safety built in. I wonder if I could just turn, turn to uh, GM Snyder just to go through a couple of those details. Sure. So um, <clears throat> the... the couple of components to this here. Um, first being protecting uh, the potential riders or the riders from being taken advantage um, of financially. And so the um, provincial regulations that they have to follow, the license that they have to get, contains the same sort of things that we do locally here for taxis. But we have the opportunity now to defer that responsibility and that cost to vet the companies and drivers to the province without adding additional local rules onto them. 
And some of the ways that the, the TNCs, the ride shares, protect um, individuals in terms of financially is through technology. And that technology allows anybody um, to see uh, what the fare would be point to point, um, the time of pickup, the time of drop off, um, or is all incorporated in with technology. And in terms of safety, those are evolving as well. Um, and this is a new development or a new transportation form um, or service. So it, it is still evolving and, and, and learning and, and, and developing. So, but some of the components are um, on the app. It uses technology again to see um, who, what the driver's picture looks like, the license plate of the car. Um, there is also a rating system, so there's immediate feedback if um, when you leave the vehicle you're concerned. And also some of the new pieces that the ride shares are incorporating is you can um, share your ride virtually, digitally, with somebody, a family member or a friend, and so they can see you in real time where your car, where your um, ride share car is moving. And, and know that when you step out of the vehicle, you're, you're safe. And so there's a number of safeguards that the province takes care of that we do locally, but then as well, technology has bridged a lot of the, the more manual safety components that we do locally. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Dominowski? Well, Your Worship, I, um, I appreciate the caution that uh, Councilor Friesen um, put into the, the question, and, and it's definitely on the minds of all of us, and our responsibility to uh, work with uh, the province and their regulations to ensure that any new uh, vehicle for hire uh, companies that move into our community um, meet and or um, exceed the, the current practices that we have for taxi drivers. Um, I'm excited by this. I know at the committee meeting we, we've already had the chance to speak to this in a public way. Um, but for the general audience, I, I, I think a couple things I, I'd like to add uh, to the broader audience is that um, we, are, we are by intention trying to be progressive and, and update our bylaws so that we can um, woo, um, I use the word court um, at, at committee level, uh, other options to our community, uh, not the least of which are our taxi services have the option under this revised and updated bylaw to um, morph and, and, and develop and, and, um, and still maintain their presence, but um, maybe uh, move into a hybrid model that other communities have, uh, I've heard have done uh, to, to a model that has uh, already been elaborated on by um, GM Snyder. Uh, the rideshare is, uh, is the wave of the future, whether it be a conventional taxi with a, a twist or uh, the likes of Uber and others. Um, a lot of safety mechanisms already built into those. Uh, and um, I like the fact that we, have a, a, we are creating the option for a variety of options to the community. And I think that's something we hear often, especially during uh, very uh, busy times of the year, stampede when we have it you know, Christmas season and others where there are limited um, access points. So this is a very progressive uh, change and I think it will um, it'll help the taxi uh, companies currently in our city um, uh, continue what they do, they do and, and maybe again move into a more, uh, a more um, online model. But also I, I really hope and, and I'm on the record as saying woo other providers and I think that in the end when you give your community the options, um, uh, you'll get better, you'll get equal or better service than you are experiencing now in any community. And um, I certainly have experienced that in other communities where I've used the services. And uh, and again, we are we've consulted with both taxi drivers and and the and the likes of the ride shares. And this bylaw again is being developed and. Um, amended in, in consultation or in conjunction with provincial uh, law and their guidance. So um, I just want to, uh, I guess, uh, I'm hoping this is a launch point for other uh, users to come to our community and we'll see where it goes. Thank you. Thank you, well said. Any other comments? If we could vote, all in favor? That was unanimous, thank you. Item 5.3 is the Energy and Utilities Committee meeting of June 4th. Just for information. So moved. Second that. If we could vote all in favor. 
And that was unanimous. Thank you. Item 5.4 is the Public Services Committee meeting of June the 8th with the Youth Advisory Board goals for 2020 for information. Um, I move the report for information. I, I need to, um, and once it's passed, I need to make a friendly amendment and would like to speak to an item. We got a seconder? I'll second that. Go ahead, Councillor Friesen, if you like. Um, Your Worship, on uh, item number one, there is only one item, uh, the Youth Advisory Board, you'll see that the committee welcomed uh, Nicholas, chair, co-chair of the Medicine Hat Library Board. Well, actually, he's co-chair of the Youth Advisory Committee. So uh, that's just a friendly amendment. I, don't, I, I think it was just a, a you know, a, a something from the, the former meeting. So if I, could, if I could make that friendly amendment without, or with the permission of the seconder, Okay, great, thanks. And I just, I, I wanted to, we don't hear from the Youth Advisory Board very often. I'm so proud of the work they do and the passion they have, and they have times when they're more active than others. But last year they had, um, they, they, they had a couple goals, they've got a couple this year. Um, really proud of them, but I wanted to bring your attention to, to one of them because so many people aren't aware of this and I just found it fascinating. So they, they are, did and will continue to explore the functionality of plastic eating worms and then educate the public on their findings. So they've been working with the students at Southview School and a worm industry firm in, um, in figuring out the functionality, what it would cost, what it would be like, what the, um, what the production would be and so on. And uh, it, it's just a fascinating project that, uh, that they, they have, um, they found it, they believe in it, they've spearheaded it, and they want to continue doing it. So I'm really proud of them, and I would, I would urge other young people to become involved with, with this group. That isn't the only thing they aspire to do. They want to create uh, more of an online presence. They want to be, have a more physical presence in the community. So we're going to be looking at, and, and we have been, and we will be bringing a recommendation to council fairly soon about the future of advisory boards and committees. And, um, and so I'd urge you to think carefully about what kind of a special place we could have for youth in our community to help advise us um, as we move forward, because they are the ones who know. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Councillor Varga? Uh, just through the chair to uh, Councillor Friesen. Um, the first goal I, I, I'm really excited about, because maybe we can push them along to the the committee that I'm involved with with the AUMA on environmental and and uh, sustainability, and we're always talking about recycling, and we've got an in for the recycle group in in Alberta, so it might be a good way of connecting them with uh, some people in in that uh, domain, and it might help them down the road in in doing some of this in our community. So there's a lot of neat things that are out there, and it's just a matter of instituting it into our community and, and having the know-how and how to do it. So if you could, please uh, send them our way with uh, that committee or myself, and we'll try and help them out in a, in a way that uh, we can. I hope we can. Thank you so much, Councillor Varga. They did, by the way, get a, a grant from, um, through, it was through the Community Foundation, but it was RBC um, that did this kind of thing across Canada. So when that, it, absolutely, that will have an end. And uh, that's a fabulous idea. Thank you. Any other comments? Seeing none, if we could vote, all in favor? It's unanimous, thank you. Our next report is item 5.5, the Administrative Committee meeting of June the 10th, with the uh, temporary road and right-of-way bylaw um, for EEU for adoption. So moved. Second. Comments? Seeing none. In, in my... Uh, 12, 13 years, I've never seen us build a road on private property, I don't think. So that's, I, I commend staff for finding a unique uh, solution to this problem of the, the construction and making sure traffic can move around. So thank you. Councillor Hirsch. Just with regard to, and I agree with the comments, uh, by the way, so I want to thank staff for, it's the, everyone refers to thinking outside the box, but I, I really appreciate, and quite frankly, the private landowner <laughs> for acquiescing and, and letting us do that. So. The question I had though was uh, tender number two, the Stratton Road rehabilitation. You know, there's been a tremendous amount of work been on uh, our Southridge roads. 
Um, and I would like to think that it was, and maybe this is my point of my question, it, I know we've got a bit of a water table issue out there and it does run into snags and, and catches us sometimes. And is this another case of that or is it, uh, you know, I always question whether or not our work that we've got done or that's been done in the past is, is up to par. So I just want to make sure that when we do have tenders like this, uh, I know, and, and remind me and correct me if I'm wrong, but you've got, you know, one year warranty on road work, et cetera. Um, but I, I, I sometimes do get concerned that, um, you know, our review and making sure that, that the, the roads are being done up to our standards is, is being done. So I guess my question is, A, has this got to do with the, the water table and just a little bit of comfort for me in regards to uh, how our inspection process works? Go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, through to uh, Councillor Hirsch, I'll refer that as well to Commissioner Schwarzenberger. You'll get a more thorough answer from Stan. Stan, can you go ahead? Thank you. Uh, as you see in the scope of the uh, tender recommendation, the, uh, the scope includes removal and replacement of the pavement structure at the top of the road, <clears throat> the storm infrastructure uh, and upgrade, and the concrete removal. So we're really talking about the surface level structure of the road, not the deep, uh, the deep um, foundation. So I, I'm not an engineer, but it lead me to think that this is probably not a, a water table issue. This is just a normal wear and tear on the road. Um, as we've seen in, or as it is described in the report, uh, this will be um, the last section between uh, Southland and 13th that would be done since 2017. So it's, I think it's more likely just a, a wear and tear related issue. Right. Any other questions, comments? Seeing none, if we could vote all in favor. That was unanimous, thank you. Next order of business is uh, the new bylaws, <laughs> item 6-1, bylaw 4617 a bylaw for the City of Medicine Hat to license, regulate and control vehicles for hire. With unanimous consent, this bylaw could go for three readings tonight. Your Worship, I seek leave to introduce bylaw 4617. Ask that to be read a first time. I'll second that. If we could vote, all in favor? That was unanimous. Just before we move on to second and third, is, is there a will to go on, do all three? Okay. I, I know that we're supposed to vote, but... Uh, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, yeah, your worship. Is there no way Sorry. that we might get some pushback on this? I think that's kind of where I was heading. Right. I'm, so. I'm just wondering if do we usually have to have a public hearing then? No. We can do all three. I was just I was just trying to hint at that in case. Yeah, I was just gonna wonder if we're going to have some pushback we'll after the out. fact if we go we'll through all three readings. Just to give you, if I could, through the chair, Councillor Vargas, we did have this come through open committee and uh, media was present. So, I mean, oh. there has been the opportunity for that to be okay. um, socialized Good. out there, not to suggest that once we do that, the very opposite could occur and we will have feedback. But um, that's just my, just wanted to let you know, this has been out in the public now. Yeah, and it's just that through the chair that when it comes hard fast, then some complaints come in after the fact, right? So, but I guess that's what we deal with then. Okay, Your Worship, I'm going to ask that bylaw 4617 be read a second time. I'll second that. Any questions or comments on second reading? All right, if we could vote all in favor. That was unanimous. And with unanimous consent of council, I'm seeking leave to go to third reading. All in favor? Does that one need a second? Oh, sorry. I need a second here, sorry. Mr. Varga. Uh, Councillor Varga. Councillor Varga. All in favor? Okay, so we no, don't have no, it. No, uh, yeah, we have no. seven in favor, uh, sorry, eight in favor, one against. Okay, so we'll bring that back in two weeks. If I could, Your Worship, I'm not trying to be argumentative, no, I, but I, I think Car Councillor Varga makes a good point. Um, oftentimes people aren't paying attention, and so it'll give them one additional chance in, in the two weeks to, to have their, their say if they feel they need one. Okay. Item 6.2 is bylaw 4.632, a bylaw of the City of Medicine Hat to open a temporary road and right-of-way on private lands 
under the direction Participant control exiting. and management Schneider, planning and development. of the City of Madison Hat. As mentioned, this is the uh, 4th Ave Northeast Temporary Road. And with unanimous consent, this could also go for four, three readings tonight. Council, I move to introduce bylaw number 4632. May be read a first time. Second. If we could vote, all in favor? That was unanimous. Thank you. Um, Council, uh, uh, introduce uh, bylaw 4632 and be read a second time. Second. Comments? Yes, I Go do. Ahead, yep. I, I was leaving that. So, uh, again, this is um, um, a first for us, and uh, I think citizens are wondering why we're doing this. So, through the chair to our CEO, if, if you're um, allow me to ask uh, Commissioner uh, Mainz as to why we're doing this and, um, and, and the good reasons behind it. So, Commissioner Mainz, if you could comment and let our citizens know exactly uh, what is going on here that we need this road. Uh, thank you. Uh, through the chair to uh, Councillor Turnbull, uh, there is a proposed new commercial development in this area. Uh, given the nature of the commercial development, uh, upgrades need to be done to the subsurface infrastructure uh, currently under El Tawana Drive. The, uh, uh, in order, uh, if that was to occur and El Tawana Drive was to be closed uh, through that construction period, given the uh, geomorphology of that area, it, it would be very difficult uh, for us to get access uh, down uh, to those businesses. So in this particular case, an agreement uh, was struck with a private landowner to allow a temporary road uh, to cross uh, their lands uh, so that the businesses uh, could remain open uh, during, the, uh, during the construction period. Uh, as was mentioned uh, previously, uh, we, we think this is a, a fairly unique uh, solution, but one that uh, we very much applaud and, uh, and support, uh, given that, uh, you know, from a business perspective, important to, to be able to stay open uh, while well, we, uh, well, we work to provide uh, more commercial opportunities uh, uh, for our residents and also from a taxation perspective. So tonight I think uh, uh, it, it's with pleasure actually we present this and again it, it, it highlights uh, cooperation uh, between the private landowner and the city and uh, compliments to all those uh, both in the uh, city solicitor's office and also uh, in environmental utilities at this creative approach uh, to this uh, particular uh, problem. Thank you. Oh, and I thank you for that because here we are in COVID-19 and there's enough businesses being shut down and unemployment and here we're allowing businesses to keep operating. Uh, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, so I guess I'll, I already introduced yep, that. We one. are, yeah, we have a seconder on second reading. Any other questions or comments on second reading? All right, if we could vote all in favor. That was unanimous. Council, um, move to a unanimous consent be given to the third reading of the bylaw 4632 at this time. Second. Okay, if we could vote, all in favor? And you have unanimous consent? Council, move that bylaw 4632 be read a third time and passed. Second. Comments? Councilor Varga, yeah. Um, just a, a question. Uh, does this hamper our fire station at all with, with the way this road's gonna be configured and does it create any problems for the, the fire units to get out of there? Maybe Mr. Mains or Commissioner Mains or CAO. I'm sure it's been thought of, right? But just looking at it, it's awfully close and if it's a busy stretch where they're using the road, is it easy for the fire trucks to get out of there? It's a good question. Uh, Commissioner Mains, can you respond to that? Uh, through the chair, uh, uh, to the councillor, I expect, I don't know for sure. Uh, I would expect, though, that uh, given the proximity of the fire station to the proposed activity as a significant uh, stakeholder, uh, they would have been consulted uh, and, and obviously, and as we said multiple times, safety is our number one priority. So it would be my expectation, but I cannot confirm that for sure. Uh, I don't know. Commissioner Mestel may be uh, uh, better able to comment on that, but again, I would, I would be very surprised had they not been consulted again, given the proximity to the proposed activity. Thank you. Commissioner Mestel, if you have a comment or... Through the chair, I don't have anything further to add, uh, but we'll certainly make sure that uh, the fire uh, service is aware and able to operationally respond 
in light of what we're trying to do here. I'm going to hazard a guess that this actually increases their ability to respond by having to respond by having this temporary road versus if it wasn't there. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Um, we have a seconder on third reading. Any other questions or comments? All right. If we could vote, all in favor. That was unanimous. Thank you. Seeing no more business before this council, we're adjourned. <laughs>